Hi, I'm Mike Conlon, your host of the Wiser Books Radio Hour. Today's guest is Lara Valeda Vesta, artist, storyteller, educator, and author of our new title, Wild Soul Roots. Welcome to the show, Lara. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. Great to have you on the show. Uh, so uh, your book is Wild Soul Runes, Reawakening the Ancestral Feminine. Is that how you presented it to us or did we change the title on you? <laughs> you changed the title on me. <laughs> All right. Uh, are you okay with that? Uh, so often we get authors who are really stuck on and uh, it, it's really a fight. Um, but uh, uh, I, I always wonder if we did the right thing. So I, how pleased are you with the title? You know, any feedback that way, be honest. I'm very pleased with it now. It took me a while, okay. you know, as a, as a writer, you get very attached to certain aspects of your book, the presentation right. of it or the languaging around it. But I had some, some insight along the way that was helpful um, and some great letters from people at Red Wheel Wiser who oh, gave me information about why they felt like this title was going to be the best. And right. now I'm all about it. So fantastic process yeah uh so one of the things that um i mean it's really interesting because i uh interviewed uh ingrid kincaid uh not too long ago it was either last week or the week before but very very uh shortly before this interview and uh, i believe she mentioned that you did some of the art in her book i did mm -hmm. how did that how yeah. did that uh how did that kind of collaboration come up come about I actually took classes from Ingrid Aha. when I first came into contact with the runes in my adult life. I have a long relationship with them, but I was in some classes with her and part of a community of people studying Northern European spirituality. So, Got it. Mm -hmm. So how did you come in contact with the runes? I mean, there was that class, sure. But before that, uh, you mentioned a long history with them. What was your first encounter and how did that develop? Well, my mother um, went to Norway to visit her father's hometown when she was 16. And she came back with this pewter pendant. And on one side, there was a spinning wheel. And on the other side were some runes. And I loved that pendant as a child. I remember playing with it all the time and just feeling this. I was a very odd, magical child growing up in the woods. And I just felt this sense of attachment to this pendant. I wore it all the time in high school, essentially stole it from my mom. And, <laughs> um, and in college, I actually paid someone to translate it for me. And it said something really benign. It says Lake, River, Mountain, Norway. So I was not super excited about the translation. And it wasn't until I became an adult that I, I learned that those were actually runes. And then I understood why I had always been attached to that pendant because they were speaking to me even from childhood. Okay, so uh, the pendant at first uh, followed you to college, the translation. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, uh, how did you kind of connect with uh, you know, the modern magical rune community? That was, well, it was through meeting Ingrid and then meeting a bunch of other people who were on this path of um, really investment in Northern European spirituality. I'd walked a lot of other spiritual paths by that point in time. I always identified as kind of a solitary practitioner, um, was pretty private about my spirituality for a long time. I grew up in rural Southern Oregon, so oh that's okay. not really a place to be super open about uh, eccentric spiritual practices. And, um, but I, it was this longing that I had for my own ancestral lineage paths that brought me to the runes as an adult. And um, in that community coming into relationship with them, starting what would be really a fundamentally transforming journey of creativity and practice. Right. So Southern, uh, Southern Oregon, Southern rural Oregon, it, it always seems to me like uh, Ashland is kind of an oasis in that, uh, in that yes. uh, uh, area. Did you ever get there? Oh, yes. I went oh, to yeah. school in Ashland. Ah. I worked in Ashland. I love Ashland. Yeah, yeah. I lived there for years. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> I actually, uh, uh, you might know, uh, they've got a bike school out there. Um, uh, United Bicycle Institute. I actually went there for... Uh, I think four weeks and wow, what a great town Ashland is. Oh, it's amazing. I still, yeah. I dream about it. It's like 
it is my place. It is definitely. It's one kind of, of a places. magical place, for it sure. Mm -hmm. The uh, the town, the place where I was staying, backs up on some train tracks, so there's a lot of open area. And one night I was out, uh, you know, basically wandering, just looking at the moon, kind of taking it all in, uh, thinking of my future, you know, kind of the whole nine yards. And in the darkness, there was some motion, which you know I froze because I wasn't quite sure what it was. And uh, four deer came up and they were just grazing all around me. And, you know, I mean, I smell like a human. I look like a human <laughs> and they just did not care. They were just sitting there communing with uh, nature the way I was, I guess. But uh, yeah, great town. Okay. Anyway, um, so runes, uh, you know, runes as writing, uh, like on the back of the pendant, uh, differs very much from how you're presenting runes in your book mm -hmm. as uh, actual beings, as actual ancient beings. Um when did you make that connection? Well, that was through a lot of the, the practice that I was doing, working intensively with the runes. They just kept showing up in all of these different ways and runes that I had never seen before, runes that were outside of the Elder Futhark or the Anglo-Northumbrian runes. Um, and then I went, I actually went back to school. I was working toward my PhD in women's spirituality. And that's when I encountered the work of Maria Gambutas and the old European sacred script. And I looked at the old European sacred script, which has never been translated. It's a collection of symbols from archeology. span um, And I said, those are runes. Those are runes, look at that, That's, those are runes. And then I started following the archeological thread. I was taking a class in archeomythology. And so looking at mythologies and archeology span together and looking at like the, um, the Scarabray dig where they had a, a little segment of what they called pre-runic writing. And again, it was looking at them and saying, oh, those are runes. And I realized that there's something in there that is absolutely prehistoric, that is resonant from a time before written history and is connective to a greater ongoing story that I think we're all a part of. That's great. <laughs> That's a great way. No, it's just a wonderful way of putting it. Um, in, uh, I think in the first chapter of your book, you talk about, uh, uh, let's see, a unverified personal gnosis, uh, <laughs> which I think is a great phrase and, uh, you know, very much describes a lot of uh, coming to know things. Um, is that the kind of, uh, is that the kind of thing that you experienced in coming to understand how the runes are? Yes, absolutely. That, that was a revelation for me, I think, for many people brought up in a culture that's rife with historical written religion, where there's, you know, these texts that we follow, um, coming into the idea and, uh, and lots of intermediaries too, right, to achieving spiritual information, you have to follow specific steps and or receive information from someone else. But with direct experience, this idea that you, everyone, all of us can receive direct spiritual information from the source is kind of a revelation. And that opened up so much for me. It allowed me to come into relationship with my ancestors in a direct way, in an unmitigated way to come into a deeper animist relationship with the place where I live, to come into relationship with the runes or even other ritual tools or ceremonial styles, really listening instead of I'm a big thinker, I'm an academic, I like to, to have the recipe, but um, there isn't one. For so much of this, it was destroyed deliberately. And so right. we, don't, we don't have it. What we have is some mythology that was written by mostly Christian people in, you know, long after um, these systems of spirituality were, were in widespread practice. And we have our own our own ability to receive information, our own gnosis. And, and then when we do that in community, like amazing, amazing things happen. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, now you're talking about, we, you, uh, you phrased it very nicely. You said Christian people were writing the mythology, you know, specifically Christian men mm -hmm. uh, pretty much were writing mythology. 
when you go back through uh, kind of historical uh, mythology, do you find a basis, uh, you know, pre, uh, pre-Christian pre men doing the writing, when you get back into uh, uh, historical mythology, like uh, you were talking about, do you find evidence of a uh, feminine origin for the runes? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, that even in the, the myths written by Christian men, there is a rich presence of the feminine. The feminine clearly in the North was um, still held a lot of power and a lot of magic. And we see this in how people talk about the Norns, in how the, the literature speaks about the Nornir as these um, primordial beings, in how they talk about the vulva, the, you know, the Norse equivalent of the soothsayer or the witch, how they talk about the Desir, who are the female ancestors of a lineage. And all of these powers come together in relationship with this well, the well of Nor uh, the Norns, which is the well of origin. And in the well, that's the well that Odin reached into when he sacrificed himself and took up the runes. Um, that's the well of the Norns. That is the well of the feminine. And we know that in many mythologies worldwide, this idea of a spring or a well or a chalice is very much a feminine symbol. So seeing that, hearing it, understanding that this is a partnership, right? This is the masculine and the feminine coming together in some sort of revelation, which we have the runes according to the myth because of Odin's sacrifice. And Odin is a, a wonderful proponent of feminine magic. He really, um, he works a lot with it. He learned uh, a deep kind of feminine magic from Freya. He achieves the runes by, I like to think of it in relationship with the Nornir because they are these primordial beings from the beginning of time. They're probably not going to, you know, just allow anyone access to the well of origin. Um, and so looking at those threads, we just have these little, you know, maybe a couple of stanzas here and there or, or a few lines looking at those threads in relationship with this larger body of archeological evidence that we have for feminine spirituality, um, you can definitely see that there is a weaving in that mystery. Got it. So uh, the subtitle, I'll say the subtitle, I'm not sure if it's our subtitle or your subtitle, Reawakening the Ancestral Feminine. Um, how does that figure into your book? Uh, what is it and why does it need to be reawakened? <laughs> well, I can talk about what the ancestral feminine means to me, um, because I'm such a proponent of gnosis. I think everyone will have their own interpretation. Um, certainly, I see the masculine and the feminine as qualities as part of a greater formula. Both are essential. They're all contained within us. Um, in patriarchy, we know that the feminine qualities have been dismissed, disregarded, you know, obscured, and that that's been harmful to everyone. We've lost a lot of our connectivity with these classical feminine threads that we've seen throughout cultures um, that are maybe a little bit more in balance than ours is currently. And so this idea of reawakening the ancestral feminine for me has meant coming into relationship with these ideas, doing research, following the threads, um, allowing for practice to inform this gnosis and really being open to what I discover so that I am becoming more whole in myself. That's the intention behind awakening those parts that have been sleeping for so long because of because of patriarchy, because of these systems that we all inhabit. Right. No, I get that for sure. Um, <laughs> now you mentioned uh, not 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 to be patriarchal, but you <laughs> mentioned that your mom was visiting her father's uh, mm -hmm. village in in Norway. Um, are there other ancestral connections with the Norse uh, with the North that uh, influence your interest in the uh, in the runes? Yes, I have a lot of ancestral connections in the north um, on both in both my lineages. My um, my maiden name is Vestnes, which is yes. <laughs> 
So my, um, my patrilineal inheritance is also from the North. I have um, Scandinavian on all sides in all directions. And <laughs> um, <laughs> it's true. And, and, and then, um, and then I found relationships with my other lineages too, from the, um, from Ireland and from Scotland. There's a lot of syncretic threads that weave between all of my lineages. I have some Slavic ancestors as well. And that's been fascinating. That's been a big part of my journey is finding, okay, what similarities do all of these people share and, um, and where do they diverge? And that's been rich because there's information encoded in these, you know, the bodies of work, whether it's folklore or language or um, song, uh, myth, archaeology in each lineage that the other ones don't have. And so because the pre-Christian traditions of all of my lineages were systemically destroyed, it's really been wonderful to go into each of them and say, hmm, what's here? Right. No, that's a great way to do it. Uh, you're blessed with an ancestry like that uh, in relation to the runes. Do people need kind of that uh, northern ancestral connection uh, to get uh, what you did out of the runes? I, it doesn't seem so. I have to say I've worked with a lot of people that have, you know, no known lineage connection with the runes and are really drawn to them. And then again, in building relationship with them and seeing them as beings, you can ask them, you can say, are you for me? And if you're listening, they tend to answer. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's biological. I think that there are, you know, there's runic information everywhere we see it in nature it's in the pattern of ice it's in the pattern of the rocks it's in the trees it's in the plants i mean there is they're everywhere so i don't see why they would be just for some people i think they're for everyone fantastic uh <laughs> so um flipping through your book uh the the initial um not, not quite a shock, but the initial uh, interesting thing about it that I found was uh, you don't use uh, traditional rune symbols. There's not just uh, one alu, you know, in there. Mm -hmm. It's actually a mandala. So it's a repeated symbol. Uh, why did you take that approach with the runes? Well, that actually came out of work that I did with Ingrid when I started um, drawing the illustrations for her book. She commissioned a number of illustrations from me. And I was really struggling with just looking at the runes in kind of a, a you know, just this one dimensional singular form and finding any sort of, you know, when I close my eyes and I see the web of weird, I see this amazing, you know, kaleidoscopic energetic web that is constantly moving and changing. And so I started putting the runes on an axis and having them meet. And then it, and then they became, they became so much more dynamic and they started making other runes and they um, began to move and twirl more like I see the web of weird moving and twirling in my visualizations. And so that's why they ended up being that form. And I like that you use the word mandala because I think that it's useful to use them in that way as a kind of meditation, as a portal even between yourself and maybe the web of weird or the other world. Um, it can be really fun. Okay. You brought it up. The web of weird. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about that. Okay. So the web of weird. The web of weird in my own cosmology, because I always speak from my own experience again, I'm gnosis based, is the web of energetic connection that forms all things and moves through all things and connects everything. And in some, um, actually in many folklore traditions, it is spun or woven into being by the feminine, by a, a goddess or by the Norns, or um, sometimes it is made into a pattern that can then be um, seen. Sometimes it's cut, meaning that's the end of that strand. 
I've found it to be an incredibly useful metaphor to work with energy. And um, as an animist, I believe everything's alive. So that makes it really easy for me to see that I'm connected to everything, even so-called inanimate objects. And imagining that there's energy, which we know that there is, like actually science proves that, running through everything is, um, and then visualizing that energy is just the next step to feeling this web in everything. All right. Uh, what was interesting to me was um, I saw the word, I've seen the word before. Uh, I'm familiar with the word. I had absolutely zero idea how to actually pronounce it. Um, so I got online like you do, uh, found out, you know, which was of very little use because <laughs> it was, uh, you know, weird or word, nothing definite, um, mm -hmm. you know, but that, uh, that led me to, to thinking, okay, you know, on, in the Christian christian tradition you've got in the beginning was the word mm -hmm. um you know you throw weird in there instead of word and you've got a whole different uh you've got a whole different situation going on there uh it's it's just kind of interesting uh love language um all right uh so the book uh the book is structured uh by uh rune once you get through the introduction the introduction is uh fairly extensive because it's 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 letting you letting a reader know how they might work with the runes how they mm -hmm. can approach the runes and allow the runes to uh to talk to them um without giving too much away it's basically a uh, a 33 week course of uh meditative uh i wouldn't even call it instruction but inspiration i guess mm -hmm. um could you just uh explain to readers uh you know basically what i've just said but in your authorly <laughs> way sure um, this, so the book began as a class. The book began as a practice that I ran for 33 weeks, which is a big commitment, let me yeah. tell you. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was very sick at the time, so that was a whole other adventure. But the idea was what happens if we give our entire focus and attention to one rune a week? All the other rune classes that I'd taken or the books that I'd seen, everything, you know, everything in our modern era is pretty fast. Like you just want the information and you want it now. But if the runes are being, say we're developing relationship with them, then we probably wanna give them some time and attention. So anytime I teach something, it's because I'm being asked to practice it. That is what's being asked of me. And I invite other people to come along because why not? It's fun with other people. The groundwork for this. So the structure is this idea of inquiry. You sit with the rune, you maybe make an altar to it. You um, bring it into your daily life in relationship and then you ask it questions and this Actually, <clears throat> I have a daily writing practice that I've done for probably 20 years now. It's an epistolary practice where I write a letter to whatever spirit I'm working with or ancestor or rune, and then I pause and I let them write back to me. And you'd be amazed what can come through you when you're open and receptive and it's 6 a.m. and you haven't had your coffee yet. And in this way, it gave me so much more insight and really allowed me to, um, to develop more of the longitudinal relationship that I wanted. And so the idea of the book is sharing this practice. And I know, you know, most people don't make it through the 33 weeks, like straight. It's a commitment. I recognize that, but that the runes are nonlinear. They don't expect you to, you know, slog your way through a practice. That's not what they're looking for. Like all beings, they're looking for your commitment are you committed to showing up? And it doesn't have to be in a comprehensive way. It can be in a really simple way of just asking, what do you want me to know? It, you know, should I work with you? So it's basically an automatic writing process? Yes. Ah, mm -hmm. I got it. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's interesting. Um, now, uh, let's see. The other thing I should say uh, that I that I'm curious about is uh, the the number of runes you got going on there. There's the uh, traditional uh, 24 Futhark, uh, but then you've got the additional nine Anglo Northumbrian yes. runes. Okay, great. I got it. Ah! Good job. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm familiar with the Futhark, uh, you know, anyone in the business uh, uh, has to be, uh, but the Anglo-Northumbrian uh, runes, uh, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with them, you know, I'm sure among rune people, they're just kind of a, well, duh, yeah, these exist. Um, 
but uh, talk to me about those. Where do they come from? How do they figure in? Um, you know, were they left out of the Futh Ark on purpose, uh, or and how do they how do they work with the rest of the uh, uh, the, the traditional runes? Oh, that's a lot of questions. Yeah, um, sorry. Okay, so <laughs> I mean, it just, you know, it just uh, it, it struck me as uh, you know, I, I, again, um, you know, familiar with the Futh Ark uh, just mm -hmm. because of what I do, but uh, uh, the Anglo Northumbrian runes you know, uh, talking with uh, uh, Ingrid Kincaid and and others, uh, obviously I'd heard of them, but uh, I, I don't think I've ever uh, paid much attention to it. So tag, you're it. <laughs> well, I, I learned about them from Ingrid. And when I started working with them, uh, you know, everyone has their own opinions about the runes because we don't really know much about them. Um, you know, the comprehensive, 24 Elder Futhark is, um, they're all contained in the same document. So that made it really easy to kind of put them all together. Um, the Anglo Northumbrian runes are in a separate document and they are considered to be by some a, a younger Futhark. Not all of them have rune poems. So some people don't even see them as runes or they call them, I've, I've actually seen people call some of them trash runes, which I think is really <laughs> unfortunate <laughs> because who are we to make that call? Um, <laughs> that feels kind of interesting to me. I personally believe that there are way more runes than we have any sort of information about. I mean, just looking again at the old European sacred script, looking at um, you know the symbolism that's present in the archaeological records, looking at again. Um, the way that runes feature in nature. I've dreamt of runes that don't exist. I know that um, other people have as well. So I feel like being inclusive makes sense. And certainly in working with the Anglo-Northumbrian runes, I've received a lot of incredible information from them. There's some overlap in the rune poems and you'll see that in the book. Um, where there's no poem, I tried to look at the etymology of the word for the rune and really um, that was fascinating because that gave me a lot more information about the possibilities in the rune. I'm just big on why would we want to limit ourselves? That's one of my questions. Why wouldn't we want to be more open and inclusive? Why do we think that we know what's really going on with the runes? And why wouldn't we want to ask them themselves? You Absolutely. Know? So uh, you said that you dreamt uh, uh, dreamt of other runes uh, when you compare notes with other people uh, who do such work. Uh, they're coming back with the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Have y'all uh, developed kind of a comprehensive list or? Uh, <laughs> no. no. Okay. That, that would be so organized. <laughs> oh, I know. And that would be terrible. Uh, that would be terrible because then we'd have something to publish. That's right. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, because it's uh, largely based on personal gnosis, there are going to be uh, runes that uh, you stumble across that are unique to you. But there's got to be something to those runes where when you compare notes, uh, mm -hmm. they end up very similar with what others are experiencing. Yes, absolutely. And that's um, in the class that I ran and in the, I'll be running it again at some point. Um, I find Gnosis groups to be incredibly important and they're important whether you're working with, you know, the, the runic material in existence or whether you're receiving new information, it is so powerful to share in community with other people and uh, and really affirming too, because the synchronicities that start coming forward are um, there, they become irrefutable when you have, you know, 10 people practicing across the world and people are coming in together and they're all seeing the same shape in a dream or in a right. visualization or um, have the same association with a particular rune. It's, it's really powerful. So yeah, it's yes. going to be kind of undeniable at that point, you know, when yes. you've got multiple <laughs> people. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, so you mentioned uh, uh, the the rune poems, um, and I've got a question here on my list uh, uh, about direct translations. Um, <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about that. Um, uh, you know, is uh, you know is it uh, an inspired translation or is it uh, kind of a a rune for rune 
um, for you know want of a better description translation. It's a uh, word for word slog of looking things up in the dictionary translation. Oh boy! Because okay. no, because the sh so the rune poems that we that we work with primarily in you know in the English speaking segments of the world are mostly 19th century translations um, that are very interpretive as translations are. And right. so when I started the practice, I, I just had a feeling, I think it was with Feu, but I can't remember one of the runes came up and I thought, I don't think that's what that rune means. I think it might mean something else. And I started translating, you know, I got an old Icelandic dictionary and found the um, Anglo-Saxon dictionaries online, which are quite wonderful, and start translating each of the poems just word for word. I don't know anything about grammar or really anything about translation. I'd never done it before, but I wanted to go through the process of, again, it's that, that drive for knowing. I want to know for myself what this means. I don't want someone to tell me what it means. Right. And that transformed everything for me. So I I share my very shaky translations in the book. They're inelegant and there is a reason for that because I want other people to, you know, this is what I came up with. Try it yourself. <laughs> See what you come up with and then compare. And then we will have more information about these rather than just relying on, again, these 19th century translations that, um, you know, we presumed are accurate somehow, but... Right. Um, but they're interpretive, just like all translation is. Sure, sure. And uh, particularly those 19th century translations are, again, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, stuffy, stuffy white guys. Uh, yes, it is. Re reading true. into it what they want to hear, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see, you've got a, uh, a little bit further in the book, you've got a divination process for reading the word uh, with the runes. Um, uh, how do you, uh, there, there's talk of rune webs. Can you describe mm -hmm. uh, that whole, that whole process, please? Sure. That's, so that's taking kind of the, the mandala illustrations to the next level and using it as a way to work with the runes in divination. Um, this is not a historical process. Um, this is my own invented process, but I've found it's really useful and powerful in getting more information than just a typical rune cast might give you. Um, so I will cast the runes in a pretty standard way and then take those runes and draw them, again, drawing them in formation on an axis so that they form a web. And I tend to draw them in the order in which they were cast or the order they appear in the cast. And what happens is that they form a web which then forms more runes because you have runes on runes on runes and that web can be used for, you know, if you have an intention that you bring to the cast, of course you can read into it from there or you can begin to use it in a meditation. You can use it for a long time to continually get more information because as you view it, more runes start to pop up and then you get more information about your query. So it's a really, rich and powerful way to interact with the web of weird. I see it as a snapshot of weird for that particular time of the cast. And then it just how you want to interact with it is really what it becomes. It can, you know, I've had people work with their rune webs over the course of the calendar year, just really delving into it and seeing what more information they can get out of it. But I do include the process in the book. So anyone can make their own rune web and and try it. So uh, you mentioned this uh, snapshot. Could it also be used in a divinatory manner? Oh yeah, that's that's exactly how I use it. It's, okay. it's just to give, um, say I have a query, I draw the web. I'm saying at this particular moment in time, this is what the query looks like. But then of course, the longer you work with it, the more questions you have, it's going to change just naturally as you look at it, just like all mandalas do, right? You'll suddenly draw your attention to something else. And that's a way to exact more information from your reading. So you're mentioning um, uh, kind of the web of the word, uh, weird, and uh, uh, you know, how these runes kind of flow together to form new patterns. Um, 
is it hard for you to look at uh, any kind of art, traditional or non, and not see runes? <laughs> um, it's hard for me to look at anything at all and not see runes. I right. can see runes. There's runes behind you right now on the screen. And there's okay. runes <laughs> everywhere. They're all over. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, obviously it's not overwhelming because here we are having a conversation and mm -hmm. you're not, uh, you're not locked in a, no. a psych ward somewhere, but, um, uh, you know, how does that impact your daily life? I mean, when you're, when you're seeing runes behind me, um, you know, in various shapes and angles and whatnot, uh, you know, now that I'm looking, it's like, okay, yeah, I, I, it's <laughs> pretty obvious. Um, you know, I mean, is it, uh, is it, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grasping at uh, uh, just a little bit of what you've revealed about your personal gnosis. Um, is it something that you work with, uh, you know, in daily life? Uh, do you take meaning from when you pick them up? Um, you know, how, how does how does your daily practice, how does your daily life evolve into or uh, impact your practice? Oh, it's it's so relational. That's absolutely it. I mean, that I. I am constantly receiving because I'm in relationship with the runes. I'm constantly receiving information from them. I'll be walking down the street. I was walking this morning before this interview and there's a Lagos rune right there, you know, a branch in the middle of the street, which anybody else might just ignore. But to me, that's saying, just go with the flow, be, be liquid, be open, allow yourself to be in relationship in this interview and all will go well. Right. So yeah, absolutely. I, yes. So that, <laughs> and that is how I live my life. That's how I live my life all the time. Anyway, even if I wasn't seeing runes everywhere, which I do, um, I'm listening. I'm always listening because I, I find that when I listen and I'm responsive, to the world rather than my own brain, things work out much better for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, so with the practice in the book, with the classes that uh, you developed that turned into this book, um, are you teaching people basically how to do that, how to uh, see the runes in daily life and uh, use that to, to interact with the, uh, with the world? Yes, yes. That's my hope is that people come to this work, develop their own sovereign relationship with the runes. And then we begin to share this information with our communities, with our loved ones. We um, can share it with each other and grow in this practice together. And I've found so much strength and, oh, just selfhood in coming into relationship with my ancestors and with the runes. And I am delighted to share this with other people. And then I love it when people take it and run with it. That's the right. goal is like, this is my practice. This is what I do, but what are you going to do? You know? And, and it's just a template. It's a, a structure that can then be adapted. And I get letters all the time from people who've taken this and they're moving it into other aspects of their lives. Or I just had a letter from a person who did the class and made a rune every week, carved it out of wood from the land where they grew up with a steel blade that they'd hand forged themselves. And they just finished the, the 24 Elder Futh Arc and they had this beautiful set of runes. So there's many ways to approach this process. Again, this is my process, but my hope is that more people feel invited in. It's not external esoteric, it's internal and it's relational. And that, that would be my delight is if people come into their own practice through this. So art, art figures into your practice. I know this because well, it's a question on my sheet here, but also, <laughs> uh, you know, just uh, what you've described, uh, working with Ingrid, uh, illustrating your own book. Um, how uh, how does that inform your practice? Is it um, do you use art to uh, explore um, deeper into your practice, or do you use it to manifest uh, what you're pulling out from your practice? Mm, that's such a good question. Um. Art is an essential part of my practice because I think 
with with words we sometimes are too much in one hemisphere of our brain and art brings us into the other hemisphere which art is such an ancient language it's pre-verbal it is um you know this idea of image and words colluding together into our wholeness is really important to me so art for me is really a channel it is i try and empty myself out and allow information to come through me into the art and and then i <laughs> i resist interpreting it <clears throat> i really try not to um because if i if i do then i i stop that channel again i'm in my own brain but um but it's another form of listening and it's a, a kind of listening that gets me deeper into my ancient brain versus my more modern linguistic brain. So uh, kind of a continuing question uh, in, in my life is always does, does art, I mean, art obviously impacts your conscious mind. Um, when you are looking at it, you're appreciating it. Um, you're taking in technical details on that and stuff like that. Um, do you feel that art also impacts your subconscious mind that there is there are aspects of art when you're observing it or participating in it uh, uh, or being acted upon by it um, that uh, aren't going to register uh, in your conscious mind that will uh, is basically communicating to your subconscious? Yes, absolutely. 100%. I think that art is you know, operates on levels that we we don't even understand. I mean, there's been works of art that I've encountered in childhood that I come back into relationship with as an adult, and I'm shocked at what I, you know, what I understood even in my child mind about a particular work or, um, or dreaming in dreaming an image you know, art informing dreams, the dreamscape of art or dreams informing art, dreams becoming art. I think that those things are as close as you're gonna get to evidence of art impacting the subconscious mind. Uh, so dreams of art, um, that that's interesting. And I've got some personal experience uh, of that. Um, do you ever try to illustrate art that you've dreamt? I do. I do. Actually, the cover of the book, the Norns, sitting at the world tree with the runes in the well at their feet, and the Norns are all shrouded and their faces are actually runes, and they're holding a, a thread together. That came from a dream that I had. Wow. And I, I'm just, and, uh, I wish I could show it. I'm looking at the cover. <laughs> And it's very obvious that the uh, what they're weaving um, is full of runes. <laughs> go figure, right? Yeah, I go um, figure. No, but that's that. Uh, that you know, it, it's, it's interesting because the uh, the technique is that a scratch technique that you used on that, or no? That's just it's illustration. Not. Okay. No, it's a, so. This is I actually draw everything in pencil, and then I ink it in pen, and then I overlay it on a commons photo of a cosmic event so a nebula or the birth that one's over the birth of a star all right and then i invert it and that's how i get <laughs> that's why it looks like that that is super cool uh neat i mean it's got um uh it's interesting because it's also got a uh a matrix like quality as in the movie mm -hmm. the matrix where you've got mm -hmm. all those numbers behind numbers and symbols behind everything it's got a, it's got that kind of flavor to it Yes, yeah. <laughs> which that might be the web of weird too, if Got we it. really want to go there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, is that how you see reality? <laughs> um, in my visualizations, sure. Okay. Yes, yeah. Right. Um, when I look around, I see pretty much the same thing. Everyone <laughs> sees only, only with runes in them. Let's face it, there's runes everywhere, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, fair enough. Um, let's see. One of the things that you're uh, very uh, forward about is uh, the role that illness has uh, played in your life. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, I, I think a lot of people are, are uh, kind of uh, hindered by illness, but, uh, you know, very much it's, it's interesting hearing about how you've lived with it. Um, and, uh, 
the I, I guess the question I'm um, I'm looking to ask is, uh, uh, you know, can you can you talk a little bit about uh, illness as initiation? Sure. Yes, um, that's been my spiritual journey. My big spiritual transformation has all come about because of chronic illness and disability. And um, I was sick. I've been ill for about a decade now with myalgic encephalomyelitis, which I had to teach myself how to say. It's otherwise known as chronic fatigue syndrome and will be familiar to a lot of people now because it's related to, well, they think it's related to um, post-viral syndrome, which is like long COVID. And um, I was ill for many years and didn't know I was ill and, um, and in then became so debilitated by um, illness that I ended up homebound and mostly bedridden for several years. And it was during that time that actually the seed story of this rune work was planted um, that so much of my art really took off because art creating heals me, spiritual practice um, heals me. And I began to see my, you know, I lost everything. I was a university professor. I was in a PhD program. I, um, I suddenly had no job and really felt like I didn't have a future. And making meaning out of that was incredibly difficult but through practice, I started to see, and in many traditions the world over, that um, people with spiritual, spiritual powers, we'll just say, I'm losing my thread a little bit here, but spiritual powers sometimes go through really heavy initiations in order to achieve those powers. It's like Odin's sacrifice in order to get to the runes. He had to hang from the world tree for nine days and nights. That's a death transition. And certainly I, um, I felt like I was dying. I was um, afraid that I was going to die in one year in particular, um, became so sick that I couldn't read or write or walk. And, and that took me to the depths of self. And when I emerged, which I did very quickly, it was almost day and night, I started taking a new medication and came out of this long trajectory into the underworld. I realized that, um, that I was different. I had changed. I was not the person that I was before. And, um, and it's given me a lot of gifts. I call it actually, um, because I still live with chronic illness. It's not like it's gone away. I'm just much more functional than I was. Um, I call it disability because the Dsir are the feminine ancestors of my lineage. And I choose to see it as their gifts coming through me. And I had to get really sick to see those gifts. I had to get really sick to kind of extract myself from all of the systems and structures that had overtaken me for most of my adult life and learn to be with what, was, what I was being called to do, which was to make art and write and share this journey. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not great, but great. <laughs> Right. Uh, it, is, it is great, actually. It yeah, is. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> I guess it's understood from uh, kind of a traditional uh, from a traditional initiatory from traditional initiatory traditions as that ordeal that you have to go through that mm -hmm. uh, that near death experience that uh, that transforms somebody. Um, I think you did a, a pretty good job describing that, but was there, uh, was there, you know, when, when you got that new drug and you, you turned the corner, um, was that kind of another point of gnosis where uh, there was an aha moment where you turned that corner? I, you know, I, I guess what I'm grasping at is, um, you know, how can people do that? You know, there is a lot of disease out in the world. Obviously we're living in mm -hmm. pandemic times. Um, the uh you know but beyond beyond that uh there's also a lot of people living with uh chronic illness uh that nobody likes to talk about mm -hmm. um and here you are very out in the open about it uh but how how do how can others this is a, this is not going to be a good question but how can others take that experience and turn it around into uh something as positive as you've managed to I think that 
everyone, you know, one of the things we're not taught about is rites of passage in this culture. You know, we, we barely have any ceremonies in our lives. We get like a wedding. That's when we become adults apparently now, because <laughs> we don't have a rite of passage into adulthood. And then, you know, you might get a couple graduations and a funeral if you're lucky, but I mean, that's, that's it. Sure, sure. But we are constantly going through initiations and these uncelebrated initiations, these unacknowledged rites of passage that we go through leave holes in us spiritually, which I think is one of the reasons why, like I said, I still live with chronic illness. I still make the descent into the underworld regularly. And it's through acknowledging those initiations, allowing, you know, uh, storyteller Martin Shaw says that something has to die in the underworld for it to be a rite of passage. You have to let something go. And then the way that you acknowledge that you've made a passage is through ceremony. You make a ritual to acknowledge something died. I am different now. And this is who I am going forward. And you share that in your community and your community gives you a new status and a new name based on your rite of passage. I know that that is not an answer to your question, but I think learning about rites of passage, understanding that we can be in many rites of passage simultaneously, and that the purpose of these passages is not to destroy us, but to actually help us illuminate our gifts and come into greater relationship with our path and purpose. That is what has empowered me. And that is what I would like to give to other people. We're gonna live with difficulty we are going to live with grief and loss. And when we allow that to be empowering and see that there are gifts in all of that hardship, and that is what our ancestors teach us. We're descended from survivors, right. all of us. Right. Then, then we have the potential to make meaning from tragedy and to embody something different, a different kind of story that says we can be disabled, we can be chronically ill, we can you know, lose people, we can have these lives that are imperfect and hard and still have a lot of power and joy in who we are. Wow. You know, that's a really great place. That's a really great note to end <laughs> this interview. So I think I'm going to stop there. But uh, okay. uh, thanks so much. This is, uh, this has been really uh, enlightening. I, I, I really appreciate the time you've spent with us. Um, so uh, for for listeners out there, for readers out there, if they're interested in finding out uh, more about you, what you've done, your work, uh, your classes, uh, anything that you got going on, uh, where can they find you online? They can find me at my website, laravesta.co. I have a school called the Wild Soul School. You can find me there too. Um, I have a Patreon where I share lots of stuff with folks. And then I am on Instagram as Valeda Vesta. Well, Lara Valeda Vesta, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. I've enjoyed it immensely. Wonderful. You've been listening to the Wiser Books Radio Hour. Find us online at www.wiserbooks.com.